Well, as I said a little bit earlier on, we're wrapping up our series masterclass where we've been uh, looking at the theme of prayer. And our prayer as a church during this series has been in the God, would you teach us to pray? You know, just like the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray, we're asking the same thing. And, and I've saved my best, worst story about the Lord's Prayer to the final week. And it was way back um, in the late 80s, early 90s, w w when I was new to pastoring, I was a curate, uh, an assistant pastor, and I, and I had to go, I was asked to go to a hospice. And I had the, the opportunity to be with a family and to pray with a family. And, and it was one of those very challenging situations because it was obviously the end of life for someone in that family. And I think I was quite nervous because I'd, I'd never been in that sort of situation before, uh, you know, with somebody at the end of their life and, uh, and surrounded by family. In fact, theological college, you know, so much of theological college doesn't prepare us in any way for ministry and, and pastoring. Um, but but, but I, I go into the room and I, I see the family there and, and, and they were so lovely. They were so gracious. They were really pleased that I was there. Uh, we were able to talk together. We shared some uh, scripture together and, and, and we prayed together. And, and just as I was about to, to leave, um, uh, the, the, the grandmother who, who'd been in the room, who was over in the corner, uh, stood up and she said to me, uh, would you lead us in the Lord's Prayer? And, and I said, of course I would. It seemed like the right thing to do. It seemed like a very pastry sort of thing to do. <clears throat> and so, so we're there and I, we, we stood around this bed and we held hands and, and I encourage people to start praying, you know, our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And then my mind went blank and I just could not remember what came next. And I don't know whether you've ever been in one of those moments where you just draw a, a, a blank and, and you feel the shame, the embarrassment washing over you and you're wondering, what do I do in that moment? And, and you know, all, all our eyes are closed except mine because I, I'm looking around and I, as I'm looking around, I'm looking for some sort of inspiration. Maybe the Lord's Prayer is, is, is in a photograph frame by the side of the bed or, or it is on the wall in a print somewhere and, and, and it just won't come and I just can't remember. And so I look up and, and, and I have to say, I, I've just had a blank. At which point, Granny comes up to me, puts her arms around me, and she takes over and she gets us across the finishing line. She leads us in that prayer. And, and I, in my mind, I'm going, thank you, Granny, basically. And, and, and then we just finished with this amen. And it, for me, it was the most awkward amen in my entire life. And, and, and I looked around, uh, said, thank you very much. God bless you. Goodbye. And left the room. And as I'm leaving that room, as I'm walking down the corridor, I, I'm thinking to myself, I must be the worst pastor ever. And I sort of get, go out to the car park, climb in the car, and I just, I remember sitting down, just grabbing the steering wheel and saying to me, I can't believe I forgot the Lord's Prayer. I can't believe I forgot the Lord's Prayer. And, and it's a true story. I was just so overcome that I couldn't remember uh, the Lord's Prayer. And some of you are thinking in this moment, Mark, this is why we did this series. You, you did this so that we would never forget. N no, actually, we've done this series so that I would never forget the Lord's Prayer again, that, that it would get down into my, into our DNA, that it would get into our marrow. Because Jesus, you know, you know, said, you know, pray like this, pray like this. You know, it's not just some routine ritual that, that we pray, uh, but it's a prayer that should become a lifeline for us, that we would be rooted in him and connected with him. But what I learned from that moment in the hospice is that anxiety causes us to forget. That, you know, that, that, that when we get nervous, when we get afraid, when we get anxious, it's in those moments that it's very easy to forget. You know, we forget names, we forget 
birthdays. We, you know, we forget what we were supposed to pick up at the supermarket. I've done that on a number of occasions. You know, we, we forget what we put in the diary. We forget dates, you know, and, 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 and we forget the things that we're supposed to remember because anxiety causes us to forget. And there I was in that moment in the hospice and I forgot the words. I, I didn't know what to sing. You know, and what I needed was somebody standing alongside me. And that grandmother in that moment, she gave me her presence. And, and, and actually what matters more when somebody is hurting, when somebody is facing challenges, when somebody has forgotten the words that they don't need perfection. What they need is presence. You know, <clears throat> when people, what, what people need when they've forgotten the words is, you know, they, they need somebody to come alongside them. They need somebody to come and put an arm around them and help them remember what's true. Because anxiety, overwhelmness, causes us to forget who we are and what we're meant to do. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why I love this church, why I love Encounter so much, because we have been given a song to sing. And it's very easy to forget the song that we've been given to sing, <clears throat> you know. And, and for those who are standing alone and wondering, why am, uh, am I here? You know, you know the, 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 those who have forgotten the words, those who are filled with shame, those who are feeling embarrassed, in those moments, what we do in this church is we come alongside them and we put our arms around them and we remind them of, of, of the words, the song that they were created to sing. It's certainly what's been true of my life. There's a great quote that I came across from Arne Garborg, who is a Norwegian novelist. He wrote this, To love a person is to learn the song that is in their heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten. Wow. I think that's really, really good. And the writer of the Ecclesiastes in Ecclesiastes 3 says, God has put eternity in the hearts of men and women. And Paul in Romans 1 tells us that creation testifies to the creator. You know, you, you put all that together and, and what you get is that, that, that God has, uh, has put a melody in here, in our hearts. You know, he, he's put the music in creation and, and we have the words to remind people, you know, uh, uh, of those words. And, and that's, I think, in many ways, what I really dream for this region, that this region, that people in this region would find Jesus and, <clears throat> and discover that he's within the song that they've been longing to sing their entire life, and that we would experience this crescendo, you know, like we did in that hospice as we came to the Lord's Prayer, because we could all remember the end. For time is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And, and, and what I want us to see today is that the end of the prayer we're looking at today is a crescendo. It's like the fireworks. It's like the celebration at the end of the prayer for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's the applause at the end of the prayer. It's the crescendo, as I've said. It's the fireworks, and it's not found in Matthew 6 or in Luke chapter 11. You know, when Jesus gives this prayer to the disciples, uh, the, the, that last part of the prayer is a benediction or a doxology that was added by the early church in the first century. <clears throat> and doxology means it's like a, a glory word or, or a word of praise or a word of exaltation, and doxology comes at the end. And, and we find doxologies... All, all over scripture, actually, over and over again in scripture. W one of the better well-known ones, more well-known ones, is in Romans 11, where Paul spends the first 11 chapters speaking to the church of Rome, and he's telling them, and therefore he's telling us, you know, how they, have they been grafted into this promise that was given to Abraham, you know, grafted in as Gentiles and included in the promises of God, you know, you know, and not by good works do we enter into the promises of God, but but by faith it is the gift of God's grace for us. And as we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the promises that we've been granted. And then after sharing eleven chapters, <clears throat> Paul goes to this doxology in 
in uh, chapter 11, verse 33, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's doxology. That's a word of glory. That is a, a word of, of praise. And lots of exclamation points. You know, you know, you know how some people are exclamation point happy when they text. This is it here. Paul, he's exclaiming. He, he's about to open up the, the Prosecco. He's about to run around the room, you know, celebrating the goodness and the grace and the wonder and the beauty of God. That's doxology. And that's what we have in this last part of the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. <clears throat> it, it's a way for us to, to give praise and glory to God. And, and, and this line in the prayer is actually inspired by a, a prayer that David prayed w when the temple was being um, rebuilt. It's, it's the celebration that we find in 1 Chronicles 29. And, and, and this is what he prays. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. And what I, I want to talk about today in, in the rest of the time that we have left is, is how do we live a thine is the kingdom life in a mine is the kingdom world? You know, how, how do we live a thine is the kingdom life? Because we do live in a mine is the kingdom world. And, and I think that so, so much of our fear and our anxiety and our worry comes from a mine is the kingdom sort of mentality. You know, we think in terms of my house or my family or, or my children or my job or my health or my body or my stuff or my relationships, you know, my career path, my financial security, my retirement, my dating life, my, my five-year plan, my vision, my hopes, my friends, my position, my future. And, and what happens in life is that, that, that we have this idea, we think, that, that, that if I could just control things, my things, then I would be happy. Yeah, if I could just control everything in my life, then I would be happy. If I could just control my health, if I could just control my marriage, you know, if I could just control my timeline, and you know, if I could just control my finances or, or my investments, if I could just control my fantasy football league, you know, if I could just control the stock market, if I, if I could just control my spouse, if I could just control my kids, if, if I could get a bigger house, a better job, you know, there, then, then, then I would be satisfied. And, and, and what all that is really is, is it's a mine is the kingdom sort of world. It's a desire for power. And, and here is the definition of power in a mine is the kingdom world. Power is the ability to shape things so that they come out our way. And a <clears throat> mine is the kingdom mentality works until it doesn't. It's effective until it's not. Because if you're good enough and if you're smart enough and if you're talented enough and you're hardworking enough, you, you can build something, you can create something, but eventually you get to the end of yourself. It, eventually you come across a wall that you can't climb or a valley that you can't cross or a, a problem that you can't solve or a, a mountain that you can't move. You know, and it's in that moment that you realize that control has been an illusion all along. And you realize that you need a power that is greater than you and that there is a kingdom that is bigger than yours. You know, and here's the thing. I felt the Lord sort of give me this phrase, actually. Without doxology, we drift towards idolatry. Without doxology, we drift towards idolatry. And, and, and here's what... Idolatry is, it's taking anything in this world and putting it on the throne of our hearts, which ultimately was really meant for God. You know, anything that we ascribe value or worth to more than God, that is idolatry. Uh, Romans 1 talks about it this way, you know, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. 
Do, do you know um, the, the, the created thing in our culture, I think, that, that we are most tempted to worship is self. It's not like a little something that we whittle out of wood and we put up on you know, a mantelpiece and, and we go, that's my idol, I'm going to worship that. You know, you know, I think the creator thing that, that we tend to worship more than the creator is self in our culture. Uh, and, and, and so what's true is that whatever we worship, that's what we go to to tell us about ourselves, to tell us who we are. You know, and we derive our, our sense of identity from that which we worship. So if we worship God, we go to God to tell us who we are. But when we worship self, you know, we go to self to tell us who we are. And so, so w when we turn inwards and we ask, who am I? We, we ask questions of, of what it is that we see in the mirror. You know, we're asking, you know, who am I? You know, why am I here? You know, you know what am I here for? And we look for those answers in self. There's a, a philosopher called Charles Taylor who calls it expressive individualism. That the idea that, that who you are is who you feel yourself to be on the inside. And, and there was a book um, written by someone called Brian Rosner called How to Find Yourself at Why Looking Inwards is Not the Answer. And he rewrites the Lord's Prayer about what happens when we go inwards rather than looking outwards. And, and I want to look at these words in, in, in what he calls my kingdom prayer. My essence within. Help me to find my true self. My kingdom come. My will be done. From birth to seventh heaven. Give me today my daily spread. Forgive not my enemies as I cancel those who sin against me. Lead me not into self-doubt, but deliver me from all external authorities. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are mine now and forever. Amen. And it's sobering when you read those words that are up on the screen. But when we've forgotten the words, what we were called to sing, that's actually what we're left with. We, and we live in a world that's increasingly forgotten the words. Maybe some have never even known the words, you know, and, 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 and you know what it's like, perhaps even as a follower of Jesus, that, that, that that maybe we wouldn't pray a prayer like that, but sometimes we can think thoughts like that and we can live in that way. So, so how do we stay centred on what is true? Uh, years ago, I was sitting at a round table conference in the States with some vineyard pastors and, and, and one of the pastors told a story about how he'd been working in his office and he had one of those office windows um, where he could see out onto a busy city street, but it was it was a one-way uh, window. So he could see out, but other people couldn't see in. And th they just, if you're on the outside, th you know, you just got a mirrored reflection, basically. And he, he told about how he'd seen a woman walking along with, with, with two children. And as they were walking along, the woman looked across and she caught a glimpse of her reflection. And she started, she walked over to the, 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 the window and started to look. And and he said he could see from the inside the displeasure on her face when she saw her reflection. But he said the two little kids came over, the two children came over as well. And, and when they saw their reflection, they cupped their hands so they could try and see what was behind the glass. I remember all those years ago, as he told me this story, uh, uh, I, I remember the Lord speaking to me about it, you know, and, and encouraging me, encouraging us to be like those little kids who help their hands, who press in to try and see what's on the other side. You know, you know because honestly, what I know about me is that t too often I can have displeasure in what it is that I see. You know, you, know, you know, I find myself thinking that I should be more mature than I am. I should be further along the line than I am. You know, I should be better as a father, as a, as a, as a, as a husband. I should be more mature. There should be more of me as a, as a leader, as, as a pastor. You see, sometimes I, I say things in conversations that, that I regret. Anyone else ever put your foot in your, your mouth? You said something that you regret? It's all of us probably, you know, and we could form a support club to encourage one another because we've all been there, you know. You know and, and when I say something that I wish I hadn't said, I, I go over it again and again and again in my mind. You know, you know I'm sure all of us, have, we've left a room, we've left a party, we've left church. And we've repeated, we've replayed that conversation that we wish we hadn't had over and over again. 
And, and, and what I've learned in, in those moments is that I can have a lot of grace for other people, but the person I struggle to have grace for the most is me. That's why I need grace. I need more grace than what I can get from what I see in the mirror. I need grace from heaven. I need grace from God. You see, you see self can't answer this longing for grace. It's been put there because only God can give that grace. You know, only God can restore and make things right and meet that longing through Christ. So I say, you know, how do we live a thine is the kingdom kind of life? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to cup our hands and we've got to look to God. We've got to look to God. If we've got to look to him, we've got to look upwards, as it were. And, and, and when we cup our hands and when we look to God, what we see, you know, it, and you've got to hear this, okay, what we see is God smiling on the other side. Did, did you know that God smiles? You know, maybe some of us have been so conditioned by past experiences or what someone else told us or, or we don't, you know, or we just don't know this, you know, no one's ever told us, okay. You know, we need to know that God smiles on us. If you're in Christ, if you're in relationship with Jesus, you need to know that God smiles on you. And, and, and let me remind us of our roots as a church. We have been grafted into the nation of Israel. And, and I want to take you back to this priestly blessing over Israel, which I pray every Sunday from number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We've been grafted in to that. And, and what that section of scripture means is that God smiles. He smiles towards you. He smiles towards us. You know, and, and any displeasure that you feel towards yourself is not God's disposition towards you. you. You have the smile of God over your life. He does not just tolerate you. He, he's not like, I'm just going to put up with him or I'm just going to put up with her. Okay. He smiles towards us. You see, God is in a good mood towards us today. And we cup our hands, as we cup our hands, what we see is God smiling at us. I, I love this um, quote from the old Scottish Presbyterian minister, Robert Murray McShane, who's an extraordinary man. Look, look, look at what he says back in the 1980s. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. 10 looks. 10 looks. You do this 10 times. Take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace. And all for sinners, even the chief, live much in the smile of God. Do you know, I love that. Someone ought to tattoo that on their bodies, or at least tattoo it on their soul. Live much in the smiles of God. Bask in his beams. Fill his all seeing. Um, uh, I settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. Before we look in the mirror, you know, would we cup our hands and see ourselves the way that the Father sees us and his love? And if we want to live a thine is the kingdom uh, kind of life, then we've got to cup our hands and we've got to look at other people as well. And, and, and what that means is we see the glory on other people. We see that other people are made in the image of God. You know, there isn't anybody that you'll come across today, all this week, all this coming year, that, 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 that wasn't worth Jesus dying for. You, you, you may not be able to see it, but over everyone's head, there is a label that says, mine. Jesus is going, mine, 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 mine. And when we cup our hands, what happens is that we can see behind the dirt. Do you know, do you realize that it does not take any skill whatsoever in life to see dirt on other people? It takes cupping your hands to see the gold. And when you see something, say something. The writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 25 says, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. It's the gift of being able to see the gold in other people. 
saying it and drawing out the song that they were created to sing. <clears throat> that, that's why I love it when I hear stories of people serving others, you know, because God gives us an opportunity to look at other people who are made in the image of God and to serve them and to love them in a way that God loves them too. So, so we, we cup our hands and we look to God, we cup our hands and we look to other people, and we cup our hands to receive his power. Listen, we, we can't actually live a thine is the kingdom kind of life in our own power. It's actually impossible. You know, and God doesn't give his power that we can live a mine is the kingdom life. So if we want his power, we live his life, the life that he's called us into. <clears throat> so, so, so what that's saying is, you know, God, my family belongs to you. My marriage belongs to you. My, my kids belong to you. My stuff belongs to you. My health belongs to you. My relationships, my, my university, my, my job, my financial security, my national service, if we're going to have that, my dreams, my hope, my, my future. God, everything I have, I offer it to you. It's yours. It's yours. And some of us, as we cup our hands today, we need his power. We need his strength. You know, some of us, <clears throat> we're coming with empty hands today and we're saying we need his peace. And we have everything that we need to live the life that God's called us to in Christ Jesus and through the power of his spirit. And it's just cupping our hands and being willing to ask and recognizing that in him we have it. He gives his power. He gives his strength. He gives his grace. He gives his peace. We cup our hands and we receive it. So we cup our hands and we look upwards to God. We cup our hands, we look outwards to other people. We cup our hands to receive and we lift our hands to give all the glory to God. When we pray in that way, when we pray about God's glory, <clears throat> what we're praying is, is in that doxology, we're saying, I'm going to give you all the credit for everything, all the honor for everything, all the glory for everything. I don't, I don't know, probably most of us at some time or another, although we might have been put off recently, most of us have flown on planes, haven't we? I don't know whether you've ever sat down in your row uh, next to a person who thinks that the whole row is theirs. They sort of, they stretch out their elbows, they take both armrests, you know, and in that moment when they're doing that, what they're declaring is that, 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 that this is my kingdom. And, and I don't know about you, but I, have you ever tried to elbow your way into what it was that you paid for? I have. You know, I, and I wonder, I just wonder, do, do we ever try to elbow our way into the glory that belongs to God? I wonder if there have been places in our lives um, may, where maybe our greatest frustration is that we've been trying to get the glory that, that, that never, ever really belonged to us. You know, you know, we, we say, you know, we say, God, I give you all the glory, all the credit, all the honor belongs to you. It, you know, has there, has there been a, a recent victory in your life that you need to give God the glory for? Maybe some credit that, that you've received and you just need to turn it around and give praise and thanks to him. You know, when you look through the portfolio of your life, you know, um, you know, you know it, 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 as it's spread out, you know, have you sort of found yourself saying it, it's, it's all me? It's all about me? It's what I've done? Today, maybe we just need to say, God, God, I give you all the credit. I give you all the glory. I give you all the honor, you know, you know, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Yours is the glory, God. And so, as I draw to a close, we fast forward together and we get to Revelation chapter 5. And, and John gets this vision of heaven. He gets this picture in Revelation of, of what's to come. And he tells us what it will be like on that day. And in Revelation 5, we read this, Then I looked up and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000. That, that, I think that means there are a lot. It means there are more than he can number. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. 
And I want to say, wow, that's a doxology. You know, that one day we will be with him. If you're in Christ, if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you know, we will be with him and, and all of heaven will be celebrating his glory. You know, forever we will celebrate his glory. And I'll tell you what's not going to happen in heaven, that there's not going to be somebody sitting in the corner saying, everybody, look at me. Everybody, look at me. You know, look at me. Do you know how many followers I've got on social media? You know, do, do you want to see my Instagram post? Or, you know, do you want to hear about what I did? Or do you want to hear about how awesome I am or how I made something happen? It's all going to be about him. It's all about the lamb. It's all about him. It's all about his glory, you know. And whatever crowns we have received, we will bow down when we come before him and we will be placing them at his feet because the crowns are for him. It's all glory and honor and praise for him. And how do we prepare for that? Well, we make it a practice in our lives here on planet Earth to give him glory here and now. This is a boot camp for eternity. This is a dress rehearsal for eternity. We just keep surrendering crowns to him, saying, Jesus, Jesus, this is all for you. It's for your glory, Jesus. It's so that other people would know just how amazing and how beautiful and how wonderful and how glorious and how good you are. So we cup our hands and we look to him. We cup our hands and we look to other people. We cup our hands to receive the power through his spirit that he has for us. And we lift our hands in praise and glory to him. And as we do that, what happens is that we connect with eternity. Amen. Let's, um, let's be still, let's be quiet, let's pray for a moment or two. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Lord, we want to be freshly connected to you. We want to be aligned with you. We want to be in tune with you that we could become who it is that you've made us to be. Lord, we pray that wherever we've robbed you of any glory, where we've tried to live a mine is the kingdom kind of life, that Lord, you would help us to surrender to you and live a thine is the kingdom kind of life, that you would help us find the song that you've created for us to sing. You'd restore your presence to us, that you would restore us that our, our roots would go deep in you, that we would grow up in you. Lord, touch us afresh with your grace and your strength. As we cup our hands out to you, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would fill us afresh with your power, with your spirit, that we would be a people that return glory to you, return thanks to you, return praise to you, that we would give you honour in our lives as we live our lives. Lord, help us to live with the end in mind. Help us to live with seeing the dignity that you've put over other people, the love that you have for other people. Lord, would you give us the, the maturity, the wisdom, the grace, the love to put our arms around other people and to love other people and help them to remember the songs that they were created to sing when you move, Lord, as we pray that you would increasingly in the life of this church, in our lives, Lord, that we would give you all the credit, all the honour and all the glory. And Lord, as we go into this week, Lord, just once again, we want to pray that blessing over ourselves. Would the Lord bless us? Would he keep us? Would he make his face to shine upon us? Would he be gracious to us? Would he turn his face towards us and give us his peace? And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of us, both today and forevermore. Amen.